The first alarm sounded just after 4 a.m. Christmas Day, 2015, awakening Butte Creek Mill owner Bob Russell from a sound sleep. Russell, also the former mayor of the town of Eagle Point, where the grist mill had sat for more than 140 years, had just concluded a busy day of work. The busiest time for that mill has always been the Christmas season. We would do 30 or more percent of our whole year in one month. And it was gift boxes and things like that. So we're slammed from just before Thanksgiving until Christmas. So no days off, long days, and I mean long days. And we would have pallets of gift boxes that we'd stay up till 10 o'clock at night putting together and someone would come in and order them. Family was in town to help out. Russell's wife, Debbie, had died just a few months before the holiday season. Yes, there was work to be done, but there was also support to be found in each other, Auld Lang Syne to commemorate. They gathered at Russell's home just across the street from the mill. We were gonna have our first day off in you know, probably two months, really. And so we had a big dinner at home and you just, melt and relax and uh, everything is great. At 4.10 a.m. my phone rings and I thought, that's odd. So I picked it up and it was just a standard thing that I had heard several times. Your alarm has gone off in the mill. And what can happen with that, on occasion a bat would fly in front of a uh, motion detector. And I walked downstairs and my living room um, was orange. And it's just like, I'm still getting the sleep out of my eyes. And it's like, why is the living room orange? And I glance out and the flames are already 50 feet high on the mill. It was just so surreal. It, it gives me goosebumps now just thinking about it, looking across the street and seeing these huge flames. So I screamed at the top of my lungs, fire at the mill and woke everybody in the house up but I'm out in the middle of the street and there's no fire trucks there. Um, it was just like, oh my God, what has happened? And you just see your life going up in flames, basically. Obviously it's one of those nights that you remember pretty vividly because you know it's an iconic structure in the city and it was a large fire on Christmas morning. I was working in our Eagle Point station. Uh, the call came in early morning hours of, of Christmas morning. Um, I remember the dispatch because it came in as a as a burglar alarm and I'm thinking well this is the fire department in route uh, to go investigate and see what was happening as we got to the end of Lodo to turn on the Platte in Eagle Point um, it became very obvious that there was a, a, a large fire as we got to the end of the street there was an obvious glow and as we made the corner it was we all were kind of taken aback by the volumes of fire that were then visible you know, in flames up above the trees and above the other structures as we turn the corner onto Royal, still being a few blocks away from the actual incident. Uh, flames were probably 40 to 50 feet in the air. Um, it was lighting up the whole area around the mill and, and we knew we had a pretty substantial fire at that point. Within two minutes, the fire department is three blocks away. They were there and I screamed at them to uh, if they can save anything, save the store. And uh, they concentrated on that. It's a big building, 8,000 square feet. I had a huge office on one end of the mill upstairs with the spiral staircase coming down. And I had my collection, my lifetime collection of photography and Civil War and antique stuff. You know, we did the best we could, but the fire was moving very rapidly and, and such large quantities of fire towards that end of the building. By five o'clock, I got a call from a friend in Florida who's watching the fire on Facebook because <laughs> there's so many people there. And it was so hot standing across the street that uh, you had to turn around every 30 or 60 seconds because it was just too hot. You know, there's no other word but surreal. You think you're in another world or something like that. And I'm sure I was obviously in shock. And, you know, we were just getting over the passing of uh, of Debbie and my kids were down there helping out and all of that and it's just like boy here we go one more thing. People were crying all over the place um, 
because it's Christmas morning. You know, they just can't believe it. And it's such an institution in our town. It was the place that people could come and always have someone to visit with and sit and maybe have coffee on the front porch and uh, always made it a happy place. One of the TV reporters stuck a microphone in my face and said, well, are you going to rebuild? And I, you know, I'm still got like a deer with headlights in my face. And I said, absolutely, if it makes any sense at all. And the next morning we had an eight foot banner that said, we will rebuild. And that started the whole process of, is it even really possible to do that? More than 140 years before the fire and whether an authentic rebuild had been considered, the plot of land next to this particular stretch of Little Butte Creek caught the eye of two men. In February of 1872, John Daly and Eber Emery purchased the land and a half mile of right of way along the creek to build a water powered grist mill using materials from the Big Butte Sawmill. The two men had previously worked together at Ashland Mills and had big plans for the area. And they wanted to build the most modern flour mill because there's, there was nothing from Ashland all the way over to the Klamath area. And they chose the site because Little Butte Creek uh, is a year-round creek and it drops about 12 feet in a very short distance. And they wanted to use this newfangled technology, which was the Leffel turbine. They hand dug a canal all the way from uh, about a third of a mile up the creek on the side of the creek. And as the water drops in the creek, it stays at that level height. And when it arrives at the mill, it's 12 feet higher than the creek is. So it goes inside the mill and dumps into a pinstock. And this pinstock is 12 feet by 12 feet by 12 feet deep. And so you have all this water in there and at the very bottom of that penstock is this turbine. It's only 19 inches in diameter and the original turbine is on the front porch of the mill for everybody to look at. But when you open up the floodgate underneath that turbine, uh, that 12 feet of water has enough pressure that it powers all of the belts and all of the wheels in the mill. And so that was a big deal because everybody comes to the mill looking for uh, they want to see the big wheel because most people associate a big water wheel in the back of a mill and our mill never had one and i've had people pull up hundreds of times and say well we want to see the wheel i saw, i remember seeing it 30 years ago and in their minds they thought they saw it but it never had a wheel so i've always offered a thousand dollars reward for a photo of that wheel and never had to take anybody up on it that early history of building this modern mill was a big deal because a turbine was unheard of. Almost every mill around had an overshot water wheel and they, floods came and wiped them out and all that. Uh, the turbine is much more efficient. During the mill's construction, trees became 12 and 14 inch square beams and posts nailed together with wooden pegs. From the Diary of John Daly, July 16th, 1872. Went to Big Butte Sawmill with A.J. Daly and Eber Emery. Agree for the lumber for the flouring mill. Flooring, $15. Siding, $15. Joy studding, rafters, and sheeting, $13. October 5th, 1872. Put sills of mill together. October 10th, 1872. Raised the first story of the mill. October 29th, 1872. Finished raising the mill today, and it rained some this morning. No accidents, all pleasant, and well satisfied. Of course, everything was timber framed and hand hewn timbers. And that was one of the beauties of the mill are these beautiful timbers that are all pinned together with oak pegs. And it's a very tall building. It's probably 80 feet tall. And if you could imagine in 1872, scrambling along the roof line of that mill, tapping wooden pegs in to set these timbers in place, let alone getting them up that high. But the real soul of the mill wasn't found in the building's wood framing or metal turbine. Rather, it was found within the two massive stones that turned this into this. Those stones made quite the journey, one that started in a French rock quarry. He used burr granite, as most stone mills do, because that French burr granite is about seven times harder than U.S. granite. 
So it is commonly used in, in millstones because of its longevity, its hardness. Now, you always think of granite as really hard. Well, every mill has what they call a crane in it, and we have one that we've rebuilt. And those cranes are designed because you have to dress your stones. And you dress your stones, uh, if you have granite, about once a month. It all depends on how much volume went through your mill, but they were the cheapest. And there's, there's little furrows in them, and it pushes the flour out. They get dull and smooth, and when they're smooth, your productivity falls to way down. And so every month, if you have granite, for instance, you would have to pull that giant thousand pound stone up, flip it over, and etch the surface with a pick. So if you have French burrs, you'd only do that every maybe three or four years. So being down a week every month, if you have granite, is a big deal, even though it was cheaper and it did a good job, but it was a pain in the butt to have to dress the stones. Not only a very efficient way to mill, but it's, it's durable. It will, it will last more or less forever. Pieces of the stone were quarried in France, then shipped to Moline, Illinois, where craftsmen assembled them into their final form. And those two stones then were put on the Mississippi River and barged down to New Orleans, put on a sailing ship, shipped all the way around the Horn up to Crescent City, California, where they were unloaded, and then Mr. Daly sent his ox cart over the mountains to pick it up and bring it from Crescent City to Eagle Point. Uh, the bottom stone is stationary, and the upper stone rotates, and we set the gap between the two stones at the appropriate level, depending on whether what type of wheat we're grinding or what type of commodity we're grinding, and it produces a whole wheat flour. And it's amazing to think that those stones uh, were put together in the 1800s, and they're as good today as they were back then. From the 1873 diary of William Hoffman, left home August 20 at six and a half o'clock a.m. and proceeded to Mr. Peter Simon residence on Little Butte Creek. Expecting to proceed on our journey after feeding our horses, but our kind hostess, Mr. S being absent, insisted we were constrained to remain overnight. I visited the new flowering mill now being erected on this creek. The proprietors kindly showed us through the establishment, explaining the operation of the machinery. The castings and shafting were all manufactured by Oregon Iron Works and appear to be of the best quality. The burrs are said to be of superior quality. The machine for partially cleaning the wheat before passing the smut machine, being the invention of one of the proprietors, seems admirable, adapted for the purpose intended. The smut machine is of the most approved kind, so that when the wheat is thus prepared for grinding, it will be entirely diverted of everything calculated to injure the quality of the flour. The proprietor expressed the will to be in full operation by the 1st of September. August 30th, 1873. Flowering mill in operation. The first wheat ran through the cleaner and dried. Operations were underway a day earlier than hoped for. People began arriving from across the region with their wheat, lines of farmers' wagons forming sizable, snaking queues. We are now ready to receive wheat in store and will commence grinding on the 10th. Our terms for grinding will be the 8th bushel or exchange. The history of putting together this modern flouring mill with a turbine and French burrs was a big deal. I mean, it's like big bragging rights. We have the most up-to-date technology in the world here in Eagle Point. In 1878, John Daly and Eber Emery dissolved their partnership with John's son, A.J. Daly, and his grandson, George Washington Daly, assuming operations. They called it the Snowy Butte Mill. The building continued to evolve. In about 1880, they added the general store. And the reason they added the general store is it was a universal truth around the whole country that the miller never got paid to make flour for people, he just kept one out of every seven bags. So if you have one out of every seven bags that you can sell, 
you need to have a general store. So that's why they added the side part on. Everything, everybody was on credit. It was all trading for cattle or trading for eggs or whatever. And so the general store was built. They also built a uh, grain crib with two by eights stacked high and nailed with four inch square nails. In 1889, other locals got an idea to build a roller mill right down the road. It is milled on big rollers that take off the bran coat on the outside of the kernel. They remove it and they take off the, um, the germ. And then they mill the pericarp or the white material, the meat inside the kernel, into a very nice white flour. In response to the community rumblings, AJ installed rollers in the Snowy Butte mill too. But the other mill that prompted that construction never came to pass. Ownership continued to change hands. In October 1892, AJ and George sold the mill to four partners from Jacksonville who renamed it the Butte Roller Flowering Mill Company. Four years later, one of those partners, William Holmes, took over the mill with two of his brothers and a man named Harry Carlton. Their flower was recognized at the Oregon Industrial Exposition in 1898 with an award called a First Premium Designation. The mill was sold again in 1916 and two years later aided in the war effort via a government contract intended to fill 70,000 barrels with flour. By 1919, the mill closed, with the Eagle Point Bank taking ownership of the property. Thirteen years later, in 1932, George Putman purchased the mill, restored the equipment, and reopened the establishment as Putman Brothers Feed and Lockers. The lockers used for meat storage were a key feature, complete with a system of pipes that used ammonia for refrigerant. By 1950, the rollers were gone and the original millstones refurbished and turning again. They came and they went. The Butte Creek Mill uh, out-survived them, outlasted them, I guess you could say. In 1972, a century after the mill raising got underway, Peter and Cora Crandall took over ownership. Crandall, who previously worked as an engineer analyzing moon rocks, traded pieces of Earth's satellite for a grind closer to the surface. The mill received a National Historic Landmark designation in 1976, four years into Crandall's ownership. Peter was a nutrition expert, really, and, and uh, loved the mill. But I think uh, what happens is you can get older, and before you know it, you're too old to really stay up with everything. It was time, I think they were in their 80s when, it, when they sold it to me. Cora passed away about three years ago and Peter maybe eight, 10 years ago, something like that. Uh, but they had a, a really good life and they lived just across the way and Peter came over all the time. and uh, He had a, his way of doing it was the way and we went go back and forth on a few things, but he was happy what, what we were able to accomplish. I have dreamt all my life and been an antique nut and collector all my life of owning my own commercial building, uh, antique building. And when I came down here in 2004 in December, uh, my wife and I took one look at it and my wife wasn't as excited as I was, but I knew I was gonna buy it the day we got there. It just needed a fresh set of eyes looking at it and what you could do with it had Saturday markets there and we had a lot of fun events. It was just great. I live across the street from it and it was open seven days a week and that's just the way it was. Never made much money, but we sure had fun. It became a uh, gathering point for the community and farmers and ranchers and community members would all come and gather. And that was true here even just before the fire in the, uh, in the 2000 years that uh, the community would come here and shop, but the community would always say people have come in 
time and time again have told us, oh, we enjoyed shopping here at the mill, we enjoyed the products, but boy, every time we came in, we saw friends, and we'd end up sitting around and socializing for a while. So it was a very important uh, community gathering point, as well as a, a mill and a store for many, many years.